let's see. There we go. All right. Well, I assume everybody here is at least has an interest in fossils. And I expect a lot of you are also collectors of fossils, like myself. And like, and I figured that like myself, a lot of you like to go out and collect your own fossils, like at Calvert Cliffs or wherever. And also, a lot of you, I'm sure, like to buy fossils. It's getting harder and harder to collect your own fossils these days for a variety of reasons. And a lot of things that we like to have in our collection just aren't available to be collect, self-collected. So a lot of us like go wind up going to gem and mineral shows that we have several of in this area every year, most of which are coming back this year after a hiatus due, due to COVID. And if you've ever looked at fossil dealers at a, a show, you, I'm sure you've been struck by the number of fossils that come from Morocco. The sheer numbers, variety, and quality of these fossils can be pretty amazing compared to uh, some of the other, there are many other localities around the world where we get fossils, but probably no other single country of its size has such a variety as Morocco does. Now, I've had the opportunity over the last 20 years or so to visit Morocco a few times. And I'll get into that in a few minutes. And I've been able to visit some of the many uh, famous fossil localities over there, as well as some of the mineral localities. Morocco has an amazing variety of minerals too, but that's a whole nother talk. And I'm not gonna to say too much more about minerals tonight. This is gonna be just a broad brush overview of the fossil deposits of Morocco. Now there are any number of these localities I could spend hours talking on just by themselves, but I wanted to give everybody at least a broad overview of what's found in the country. Now my title of my talk is a Morocco, a fossil collector's paradise. And I put a question mark there. There's some factors involved in the fossil trade of Morocco that you might, some people might consider that would make it not such a paradise after all. We'll, we'll get to those at the end and I'll let you all make up your own mind. Let's see. How do I advance this? Do you use the, can you use the, the arrow buttons? Does it go? Hi, nothing's happening. If you move your cursor, if you move your cursor onto the screen, there you yeah. go. And now, now, now do it. There we go. Thank you. There you go. I've done this uh -huh. a few times before, but it's been a while. All right. How do I get to Morocco? go to Morocco in the first place. It's all through the efforts of this lady here in the middle. Her name is Sarah Mount. I first met Sarah over 40 years ago down in North Carolina. Uh, if you're any, any of you are rock hounds, you're familiar with the ruby and sapphire mines in Franklin, North Carolina, which is up in the Western mountains. I used to go there hunting for rubies and sapphires. Sarah owned a gym shop in the town of Franklin and her husband ran a motel. And the thing to do in Franklin after a long days of collecting uh, sapphires and rubies would be to bring them into Sarah's shop and she would sort through them and figure out which ones were worth having cut into gemstones and which ones were specimens and which ones were just junk. Now, over the years, the sapphire and ruby mines in Franklin declined, and business in the, the motel and the gym shop declined. So Sarah decided to get into another line of work. So she opened a travel agency. And at first, she was doing the usual travel agent stuff, like cruises and trips to Europe and things like that. But her interest in gemstones soon merged with her interest in travel 
and she started doing trips oriented towards mineral and mineral and gemstone collectors. She first started that by going to Brazil. And I went on several trips to Brazil with her to meet to visit some of the gemstone localities down there. And that's yet that's yet another story which we won't get into tonight. But eventually she was out in she was out in Tucson at, at one year promoting her Brazil tours. And she met these two fellows. This, this is Adam Aronson and his brother Isa. They're from Morocco. Their father was uh, their father was German, their mother was American. Uh, the mother and father met in Morocco and had a family. And these two are a, a couple of, the, of several siblings. They're in the fossil biz business in Morocco. They import literally tons of fossils from Morocco every year and exhibit in Tucson. And in addition to buying and selling fossils, they do tours. They have tour guides in Morocco, and they know all of the mineral and fossil localities that you could ever want to go to in Morocco. It's through their efforts that Sarah and her customers are able to get into many of these localities in Morocco. Morocco, anybody can go to Morocco. It's easy to, it's easy to get to. There's no visa required or nothing, but getting from after you step off the plane, you've got to know where to go to see the fossils and the minerals. And these guys know it. Bit of a geography lesson to begin with. Morocco is on the northwest coast of Africa. Right up here's the Mediterranean Sea. Right across, there's the Strait of Gibraltar. Right up here would be Spain. It's a country about the size of California. The dominant um, ge geographic feature of the country is the Atlas Mountains, which are in three distinct ranges. The High Atlas runs all the way from south southwest to northeast over most of the country and actually winds up in Algeria over here. The High Atlas gets up to about 12,000 and something feet. There's the Middle Atlas Mountains, which is another range, which is to the northwest, and the Anti-Atlas to the uh, south, south, southwest. Over here along this side of the country is the beginning of the Sahara Desert, which runs from here about 3,000 miles east until it, you get to Egypt. Uh, the capital of the country is Rabat, which is up here on the coast. And the largest city is Casablanca. Casablanca, incidentally, looks nothing like the movie. The movie was not even filmed there. Casablanca is a big modern city, a lot of industry. But it is where the main airport is. So if you visit Morocco, that's where you fly into. Where am I? Yeah, right there. It's, uh, you can get a direct flight from Dulles Airport Seven, seven and a half hours, you're there. Most of the, the uh, main cities are connected by four lane freeways. And most towns are connected by, uh, at least by two lane paved roads. So getting around is not a, a big deal. But to get to some of the fossil sites, you will need a four wheel drive, which Adam and Isa both own. Now, some of the stars here I've, I've marked are some of the major fossil localities, uh, which I will touch on each of these in a, a few minutes. Uh, where did my cursor go? There we go. Taouz, Erfoud, and uh, Al Nif over here in the edge of the desert. Kariga, which is a major, major pho phosphate mining locality over here on the uh, coastal side of the mountains. A little bit here in Medelt and Warzazat, which are both uh, major mineral localities, but there are some fossils in the area too. Now down here to the south is the Western Sahara Territory, and I will touch on that later. That's a bit of a disputed area. 
But like I said, getting around Morocco is not too hard. You can drive just about anywhere. But like uh, in the United States, you never know when you're going to run into a traffic jam. Right, the first locality I'm going to uh, touch on is Jisamur Mountain, which is near Al Nif, which I showed you is over on the, the uh, eastern part of the country near the Sahara Desert. This is a Devonian age formation. And this is where so many of those fancy trilobites come from. You see these in almost every show you go to. And there are numerous species, and they seem to find new ones all the time. And they're some of the most exotic trilobites you will see anywhere. And there are also cephalopod fossils and some crinoids there too, although those are better developed in other areas. That's the mountain there. It's an erosional remnant from a sedimentary formation. It's a few hundred feet high, it's not a big mountain. But most of the trilobites come from this layer here about two thirds of the way up, several hundred feet up this slope here. Now what they would do here is they would dig into the side of this mountain as far as they could until the danger of a cave-in became too great. So they would stop digging, then they would move over, start digging again, keep moving. But at this point, they, today they have gone all the way around this mountain. So there's not much more coming out of this particular locality. Uh, there's the, uh, Preparers and the shops have lots of this material on hand though. You still will see a lot of fossil trilobites for sale from this locality. And there are other localities in Morocco that also produce trilobites. Uh, this is just the most famous probably. Now the way they find these things, they pry out these blocks of limestone and just crack them open. And you see here this thin black line. That's a trilobite. You may be familiar with the little Elrathia trilobites that come from Utah. And they find those by splitting shale. If you're lucky, the, the trilobite just pops out and it's just perfect. But not here. These are completely embedded in limestone. And the limestone does not split. So they'll find them by cracking blocks of limestone and looking for these cross sections. Now they will take this and they will remove the matrix from the top and sides of the trilobite and glue the two halves back together. And done properly, you can still get a very fantastic specimen. Some shops, some preparers just use a simple hammer, hammer and small chisel or even a nail and you get some fairly, fairly crude preparations that way. But there are shops in uh, the town of Air Food, which we'll get to in a few minutes, where they have some sophisticated preparation equipment. This guy has a little pneumatic air hammer. And he is, where he, he's preparing this specimen here with two large fancy trilobites on it. This is a, a natural specimen. These were not put together. Well, I'll get, I think we'll see that again in a minute. The same shop also has this micro sand blaster to get the really fine details. Even, the, even with this though, some of those little fine spines and projections will, will still break off. So they have to glue those back. So almost every trilobite you see from Morocco has had some repair done to it. And this is okay as long as you're aware of it. And as long as the part that they put on was originally part of that same fossil and not something that was pulled out from something else, which we will see in a little while it does happen. Oh, there it is. That's the one the guy was working on before. These are about four or five inches long. These are 
Drotops armadas, also called, sometimes called Phacops armadas, which is in the, be relative to the Phacops reina, which is found in North America. You can see all the uh, spines that they've managed to save on these, these two. And these two are where they were found together. It's a fantastic specimen. That's a pretty exotic one there. This is about four inches long. This is Wallicerops trafricatus. And it's got this three-pronged fork that sticks out in the front of it. The function of this, I have no idea how the animal would even move around with this thing, but it must have served some function to be that well-developed. This one is called Urbino Cali. It was a recently discovered species. Uh, known for the, the most spectacular feature of this is the compound eyes. They're some of the largest compound eyes you'll see on any trilobite. Now, you may have heard that a lot of trilobites from Morocco are fakes. And that is true. A lot of the cheap stuff you see. Uh, in Morocco, you see these things for fossils for sale in stands alongside the roads and just about everywhere. And a lot of the cheap ones really are fakes. They're casts or, or there's a fragment of trilobite where they filled in all the rest. But there are a few things you can look for. Look for the fine details, like the facets of the eyes. If you, uh, my photograph here isn't quite in quite in focus as it should be on this eye. But this has thousands of little facets of the eye. These are usually not preserved in, in casts. Also in the really poor quality ones, you sometimes see air bubbles in them. So that's an obvious giveaway. And the, uh, the casts are also painted a uniform color, usually flat black. And you can see the variation in color in this specimen. So that's, this is a genuine article. And these can be purchased in Morocco from the dealers. They're not always, ones like this are not cheap, but you can still get a better deal than you would at a show in Tucson or something. And you see things over there that you just won't see at your average show or even in Tucson. Moving on, Erfoud is a town not far from uh, Al Nif, about an hour's drive maybe, also near the edge of the Sahara Desert. This, this area features Silurian to Devonian age formations, and the fossils include abundant cephalopods, which are mollusks related to the chambered nautilus, including Orthoceros, Goniotites, and also very fine crinoid specimens. This is an outcropping just out in the desert. And you can see this is just chock full of these straight shelled nautiloids, cephalopods. These are the Orthoceras. There are just dozens of them in this natural outcrop here out in the desert. And you can see also some coiled ones like this one here. This is the goniotites. And they quarry this limestone out in the desert there. This is one of the, one of the quarries. This one hadn't been active lately and a lot of sand had drifted over it. But you can see some of the blocks that had been uh, dug out. There, there's some more of them. They, they quarry these by drilling a series of holes and then they drive wedges in there and they will crack off these large blocks of limestone. These are maybe two or three feet thick and cut them in blocks, maybe four by six or four by eight feet. Pretty good size. And these are just chock full of fossils. And they'll truck these back to town in their food and They'll have these cut in, into specimens at one of several localities. This is one, one of the larger factory, cutting factories. 
And this is a big reciprocating saw where they're cutting up one of those large blocks of limestone like I showed you in the previous slide. This, here it is here, it's about four feet wide and about two feet thick. And they're cutting it into a series of about eight or 10 slabs, each one about six or eight inches thick. And there's a, a, a blade charged with, I think it's silicon carbide cutting each one of these. You view, the, view this from the other side, there, there you can see the, how this is driven with this big wheel and there's an electric motor. And there's the block from the other side. And that's the largest piece of lapidary equipment I ever saw. And from there, they'll they slice, cut this up, and they, the larger pieces they'll polish with a, a, a machine like this. They got this rotating head with polishing compounds on it. And there's a lot, they use lots of water on this to keep the dust down. So it, there, there's a lot of mud on the floor, but really it, it in this area, but it really is a, a clean and fairly safe place to work. And they cut and they, they, they build these fossil slabs into everything you can think of up to and including the kitchen sink. These are some of the larger pieces that they've made there. You see a lot of these uh, slabs here that are just for display. This is about three feet high, maybe three feet this way too. Several orthoceras and several goniotites in the same piece. Sometimes they will assemble these out of different uh, specimens. If they're, if they're not aesthetically arranged, they may add a, a a piece here or a piece there. They've cut out of another piece of rock and put in there. These are mostly just for decorative purchase purposes. You would buy this to put in, put in the lobby of your office somewhere. They're mostly like, so they're, they're mostly decorative. They're not really uh, collector's pieces. You see an awful lot, a lot of stores have these small pieces available. You see a lot of these at rock shows. Every rock show you go to, you can find polished orthoceras and goniotites. Like there's some medium sized pieces. There's some like ashtrays. These are some pieces with several orthoceras. And there are various other things, all, anything you can think of including small pieces that are used in jewelry. Now, some of these are made in the factory like I just showed you, but a lot of them are made in places like this. This is out on the backside of the town along the riverbed, which is mostly dry. Uh, occasionally they'll have a, a flash flood though and this place gets washed out. They built these shelters here out of sticks, bamboo, and plastic sheeting, and old car bodies and things. And that's where guys work polishing the smaller pieces of, of cephalopods. This guy is sawing up a block of limestone with a carbide wheel with no water, no nothing. And you can see this cloud of dust he's kicking up. And he's got a thin strip of cloth wrapped around his face. And that's the only protection he's got. You can see that this is made out of bamboo and plastic sheeting and old plastic paper bags. So this is really a miserable place to work if you ask me. And this is where a lot of those smaller pieces of orthoceras and goniotites come from. So this is one of those negative uh, aspects of the fossil trade in Morocco that I mentioned. This is also near air food. This is out in the middle of the flatlands. And this is where they're digging for crinoids. There's a, a string of these little pits goes off into the distance here. And these, these have been dug out by hand. They go down about 10 or 12 feet to the layer where the crinoids are. 
uh, you know, down to the, then they'll dig sideways to get to the, bring out the layer pieces of crinoid bearing rock. Once again, as far as they dare go until they, they give a danger of it falling in on them. These crinoids come out in small pieces like this. Uh, I assume everybody knows what a crinoid is, but just in case you, you, there's some people that don't, these are commonly known as sea lilies, but they're, they're an animal really. They're related to starfish and sea urchins. You can see a good part of one here. And they, uh, they like I said, they, they're called sea lilies and they resemble plants. Most of them have the, the body of the animal which is like this with tentacles to each filter out plankton. And, it's, and it grows on a, a stem, which you can see here. And in most crinoid species, this will be anchored in the bottom of the sea and the, the animal will be sticking up. This is a species called Siphocrinites, which instead of being anchored to the bottom, had a float. It had a round bulb, which was filled with with gas, which would float on the surface of the sea. And the animal would hang down from that and then filter plankton from there. And they theorized that they, they would form these colonies of you know, several dozen individuals at least. And they would float on the surface of the sea. But occasionally there would be a storm or something and the floats would break off. And the whole mess would settle to the bottom of the sea, and you would get these ma mass death specimens of crinoids like this. That's one that's been cleaned up and probably put back together. Uh, you can see the fine details on this one. This is a, a nice piece. This is in my collection. See, there's the stems, there's the body of the animal, there's the uh, tentacles, the arms. There's a ruler. This is a little over a foot across. Nice piece. Some of these plates get rather large. You can see the, the size of this one compared to the two people that are looking at it. Now, something like this would be, where well, again, like the cephalopod plates, would be primarily for, a de for decorative purchases. Somebody with a lot of money to spend could buy this and put it in their living room against one wall and, or in their office somewhere just to look pretty. But they, they, they are some very nice specimens though sometimes. And moving on again, brief visit to Mibladen. Those of you who are into minerals will recognize the name Mibladen which is near the town of Medelt, which I showed you a, few, a little while ago. And Mibladen is the, one of the centers for mineral collecting in Morocco. It's very famous for vanadinite. Probably the best vanadinite specimens in the world come from Mibladen, from the old lead mines there. But in the area, there's also copper minerals, agates, quartzes, and a variety of other minerals too. But there are some fossils. The age of this is early Jurassic. And you in places you find dinosaur tracks and a few dinosaur bones. This is one of the old lead mines near Bimbladen. This is where a lot of the vanadinite comes from. The local diggers will go into these abandoned mines and work their way down there, hoping to find vanadinite. If you look in some of the uh, rock formations near near the entrance here, oh, where did my cursor go? I don't, I don't, there, there we go. Over here, where the layers of rock are overhanging, you see dinosaur tracks. This one here is about a, a foot long, with three toes. This is a theropod, one of the big predatory animals a medium sized one, not as big as a T-Rex, but probably a, a good sized animal. This slab shows 
ripple marks, which shows it was at the edge of a body of water, and some small tracks, and also these scratch marks. These scratch marks are where a dinosaur was standing and then suddenly accelerated, pushed off, and his foot slipped a little bit. Maybe he saw one of those big guys coming. I don't know. But you found, this is another example there. Basically, we saw that at that locality, there were two, the larger one and the smaller one. I don't have any pictures of dinosaur bones, but in the area, they do find a few isolated dinosaur bones. Uh, some pretty large ones, too, probably from sauropods. Not a major fossil locality, but kind of interesting. Along the same vein, a stop, brief stop at Warzazot. Warzazot is another mineral locality, primarily. It's not far from the mines at Buazer, where they have, which are major cobalt localities. They find a lot of interesting cobalt minerals, like, like erythrite and uh, scutterudite. There are also some interesting uh, amethyst deposits in the area. But there again, they're fossils. In this particular case, there's some stromatolites. This is a field of stromatolite fossils right by the side of the road. Uh, it doesn't show here, but just off to the right is a major road. All you have to do is drive up there, stop, and there they are. Stromatolite, a lot of you are familiar with stromatolites. They're formed by layers, layers upon layers of photosynthetic bacteria. And they, they deposit this hard uh, matrix with them. Some of the earliest known fossils on Earth are stromatolites. Some of these go back almost three and a half billion years. This particular site is not that old. This is Cambrian, which is about 500 million years old, which for anything else would be a pretty, pretty ancient formation. But for stromatolites, this, these are youngsters. Now, you may know that stromatolites, though, are, are not extinct. They're still around today, but they're not very common. There's a place called Shark Bay in Australia where you can, you can see these growing alive today. It's a very saline environment there, which not, so not much else lives there, but the stromatolites do. So, but the, these mounds here are shaped just like the ones that are still alive in Shark Bay. They haven't changed that much. These are kind of silicified, but they're not solid enough to really polish. I tried it, but it didn't work very well on a little piece. Now, here's a big one, Karibga. I showed you this on the map. This is the phosphate mining locality. Those of you who are into fossils will know that phosphate mines are some of the best places to find fossils. Uh, if you ever, any of you, a little old, older timers like me you have had the uh, fortune of, of going into the Lee Creek phosphate mine in North Carolina, or maybe some of the phosphate mines in, in Florida or other places. You can find all kinds of fossils. Morocco has about 75% of the world's reserves of phosphate, which is a staggering amount. Imagine how, how big places like Lee Creek are, take all of those places in the world, lump them together and multiply by three, and that's Morocco. It's just tremendous industry there, phosphate mining. And in the process of mining, they uncover lots of fossils. At the uh, active mines, the, uh, they'll usually let the workers grab something that they uncover if they can do it quickly. If it's something big that would take a while to uh, excavate, they, they don't let them do that. Those just, a lot of those just get bulldozed and mixed into the phosphate ore. But they range, this, these deposits range in age from Cretaceous to Eocene, about 70 million to 41 million years old. Fossils include sharks and rays, 
over 250 species of these. Otodus obliquus is one of the, the most uh, prominent ones, which you'll look at in a little bit. You can find this species in Maryland too, down at uh, uh, Liverpool Point. Also, they have this place is famous for mosasaurs, at least 13 species, including Pronathodon and Globodon, so they're common ones. There's a plesiosaur, which is Zarapha Sora oceanis. This is, you'll see this in a few minutes. This is a long neck marine reptile. Other things include other reptiles, including crocodiles of all sorts, turtles, and even snakes. There's numerous, numerous bony fish, which I won't get into really, and land animals. Now, this was a strictly marine environment, but it was close enough to the shore that occasionally a carcass of a land animal would, would get washed in and bits of it would settle to the bottom. Now, given how many sharks and crocodiles there were there, they probably took care of those carcasses pretty quick. So you don't find a lot of well articulated skeletons of land animals, mostly just fragments. But they include mammals, dinosaurs, birds, and pterosaurs. Notably, elephants. Two of the earliest known elephants, including Erytherium, which is late Paleocene, and Phosphotherium, which is uh, early Eocene, some of the earliest known elephants there. A few dinosaurs, including this one, Kinanisaurus barbaricus, which is uh, a, a large uh, theropod, a predator. They're, well, medium sized as those things go, probably 20 feet long or something. And among the birds, there's Dasornis. There's several species. This is one of the, the so called pseudo tooth birds. As you all know, modern birds do not have teeth. All of the birds that had teeth died out with the dinosaurs. But this thing had uh, little bony projections along its beak that functioned like teeth. And some of these were huge. They got, had wingspans as, as much as 15 or 20 feet. And they lived like a big albatross or something. They used that tooth beak to snatch up fish and squid and stuff like that from the water. Now this is one of the, this is out in the middle of the phosphate mining area. This is an area spot that had been mined and abandoned. Piles of waste material. And you can see, and uh, some, but some of the formations are exposed. You know, the time we were there, we, just wandered around and picked up, you pick up shark teeth and little bits of bone and fish teeth. It's another place. This one had some mosasaur teeth that you could find. This is how the, a lot of the small stuff gets found. People just picking over these old mined areas. But some of the local people are seriously into this trade will uh, go after the big stuff. And this is one of the sites where they do that. Where they were doing that. This fellow down here in the bottom uh, of the pit here, his name is Kabir. He's a major local dealer in fossils. He had hired some men to dig this hole here down to the Cretaceous layer. And he had found something. This is a mosasaur skeleton that they had uncovered. And there's Isa examining it. There's Kabir having a good close look at it. And we got to go down into the pit and have a look at it. Did not, did not get close to the, the mosasaur specimen, but over to the side of the pit, away, well away from it, we were given free reign to have a whack at it. And there's Sarah taking a pick to the side of the pit in the Cretaceous layer. And there's a few fossils that I was able to collect in just a few minutes. 
this is like 10 or 15 minutes collection. There's a couple of mosasaur teeth, a few shark teeth. These are fish teeth. And none of them are great, but considering how long you have to hunt for something like this around here, it's pretty remarkable how much we were able to find in just a few minutes. Now, from there, from the pit, we went over to Kabir's house where he keeps most of his fossils. And he was able to show us this. This is the skull from that mosasaur that they'd already taken out of the pit. Doesn't look like much. There's a tooth, there's a tooth. That's probably a jawbone. Uh, they had encased it in a plaster jacket, which is, you know, the uh, standard method for removing large vertebrate fossils from the ground. And they would, th this is something that uh, Adam or Isa would buy from somebody like Kabir. And they would take it back to their workshop, which is in Rabat, and prepare it out, and then haul it over to Tucson and sell it. And that's what it would look like when it's prepared. This is not the same specimen, but it's one very similar and a very sim the same species. And like I said, this was for sale in Tucson a few years ago. You can see the teeth on this thing. This was about 30 feet long or something. The, the ones over there get up to like 30, 35, maybe 40 feet. And they, they do an amazing job of preparing some of these. Usually they have to fill in a few pieces where the uh, bone was missing or maybe something else came along and ate it after it died. That, that is a, a pretty good specimen there. And this would go be for sale. A wealthy collector could buy this, or hopefully it would go to a museum. That's the plesiosaur I mentioned, a long neck marine reptile. There again, that's about 30 feet long. The head on this is relatively small for the size of the animal, but it lets us sharp teeth and probably would snatch fish. The other one would eat anything it liked. That's a turtle. That's about six or eight feet long. A snake, a sea snake. Stretched out, that would be about 24 feet long. The head of this is not original. It, uh, this is reconstructed as best they could, but most of the, the vertebrae in the ribs are original. And that's a, like I said, that would be about 24 feet long stretched out. I mentioned Otodus obliquus. That's one of the larger sharks that are found there. We find thousands of these and you can see them at any rock show. You said you can find these this species at Liverpool Point in Maryland. Been down there hunting all day, maybe find one or two little one inch ones that are probably broken. It's nothing like the abundance you see in Morocco. That's a mosasaur tooth, like the species I showed you the skeleton of. I guess this this was a big, big predator, probably ate anything it felt like, including other mosasaurs. This is a tooth of another mosasaur. This is Globodens. They think this was a shell crusher. It had these blunt teeth like this. It was a big animal too. It probably got up to 30 feet long or, or more. Uh, one thing you do not find over there is mollusk shells. The chemistry was not right for preserving shells for some reason. I'm not real clear on how, what the difference is, but this would probably crush sh mollusk shells or the larger ones I suspect probably crushed up turtles. There were a lot of turtles there too. And this is one of the more special things. This little jaw here, a couple of teeth in it, you can see the size of the quarter there. Elephant. This is Phosphotherium, one of the elephants they find over there. This is the uh, early Eocene one. Probably a, only a 15 or 20 pound animal. 
And Eritherium, the older one, was only about a 10 or 15 pound animal. So like um, many other lineages, elephants have got increased in size over evolutionary time. But this is one of the earlier ones. And they find this at the, these at the Eocene layer. This is something else you see a lot of. These are fake Mosasaur jaws. You see these for sale at a lot of rock shows and you gotta be careful of them. These are real Mosasaur teeth and probably a real piece of bone that they, some miscellaneous piece of bone that they would find, their rib bone or something. And they've embedded it in this fake piece of matrix. And they, they, and these, and they sell these. There's a couple of things you can look for. The root on a Mosasaur tooth is about two or three times longer than it, the crown is. So the root on this thing would, would probably be down here if it was a real jaw. So the piece of bone here is not big enough to contain that root. And like and this one isn't either. The other thing is there in the fakes, there will be a thin layer of amorphous brown material at the base of the tooth. That's a plaster that they use to uh, fill in the gap between the bone and the tooth. If in doubt, put it in water. The plaster will fall apart. You gotta be careful of these. If you see these, it shows. There again, like anything else, it's best to know your dealer. Oh, same thing with the, the shark teeth. They find a lot of shark teeth with, with the roots missing. And they'll take that same plaster and make a fake root out of it. There again, if you're in doubt, put it in water. Moving on to the other, one of the other major fossil localities, these are the Kim Kim beds, which are near Taos, which is another place over near the Sahara Desert. Not far from Al Nif and not far from Air Food. This is Cretaceous in age, and it's really famous for its dinosaurs. And anybody that's into dinosaurs will recognize some of these names. Spinosaurus Egypti Egyptiacus, which is probably the most common, one, also one of the more larger and more bizarre animals you'll see anywhere. You'll see, you'll see some more of these in a few minutes. There's Carcharodontosaurus Saharicus, which is a big theropod about the size of a T-Rex. Delta Dromius, which is a smaller theropod. I say smaller, it was still got up to as much as 40 feet long and about three and a half tons, but that's compared to the six tons for the Carcharodontosaurus or more. Delta Dromius was just more slender and uh, probably a faster runner. Delta Dromius means delta runner, by the way. There's an Abelisaur, which is another theropod, and Rebachisaurus, which is a big sauropod. So you find at least five different species of dinosaur there. Also, you find pterosaurs, mostly just teeth, numerous crocodiles, numerous turtles, and numerous fish, including sharks, which is a hibotus, which is the, you see these mostly as the dorsal fin spine, Sawfish, lungfish, gars, and coelacanths. Now, the habitat here was a large river delta, very large uh, river system there. And this is where uh, these the dinosaurs, especially Spinosaurus, would live. Large river and delta, de delta formations. Because of the current there, a lot, you don't find a lot of our associated bones, mostly just find isolated teeth and the occasional bone. Although they have found a few skeletons, at least one skeleton of Spinosaurus, which is a very important find a few years ago, but mostly just one, thing, one piece at a time. This is uh, the Kim Kim beds. Looks a lot like Jizamur Mountain, where the trilobites come from. 
But this is the edge of a plateau. And this outcrops from along a distance of maybe 120 miles east of the town of Taos, up past their food, and then around a little bit to the west. Across this ridge and a few miles in that direction is Algeria. So you're right near the border. You get to the base of this thing. And where the uh, most of the fossils come from at this site is up near the top here. And you can climb up the side of this hill to where they do the digging. And you'll find a whole series of little holes where they've gone into the side of the mountain here looking for fossils. This, this, is a, this, this young boy from the nearby village, was, his name was Mohammed. He came along and he saw us coming. He came, came out and joined us, we had to come with us. But this is one of the tunnels here. This is not really solid rock. This is mostly sandstone and layers in this are just loosely consolidated sand. We were invited to go back into this tunnel and see where they find these things, but I, I declined and so did everybody else with us that day. I'm told that about one person a year is killed in a cave-in in digging for these dinosaur teeth. Uh, so it's not, not exactly the most uh, safe thing to be doing, but a lot of these dinosaur teeth do come out of here. There's Isa holding a bone, probably a vertebra or something. Don't know what that they had found in that hole. We took a, lot, a look around and picked up a few bone fragments on the surface there and then back to the, down the hill to where we parked our cars. And soon Mohammed brought out these fossils he had for sale. This other fellow from town came along with more fossils for sale. Spinosaurus teeth, shark spines, et cetera, et cetera. And some decent specimens. And we did a fair amount of business with these fellows. Now this is back in their food. This is one of the big dealers. That got what, a dozen flats here of teeth. Each one with like a hundred Spinosaurus teeth. Several of these are Car Carcharodontosaurus teeth. And you turn around the other way and there's just as many more flats. There's just an amazing number of teeth come out of here. I don't know if anybody here has ever hunted for dinosaur teeth in this country. Huh? I've always wanted to, never have. But there again, you would hunt for days and maybe find one. Here, there you get thousands of them, just amazing number. And these are all good pieces. That's a close-up of a Carcharodontosaurus tooth. See, it's uh, serrated here like most predators. It's a little bit thinner and more blade-like than a T-Rex tooth, but still, this was a big, nasty predator. Spinosaurus teeth. That bigger one is about five inches long, and I've seen them bigger than that. Now, that's something that's really sought after and hard to find. This is a hand claw from a Spinosaurus. Spinosaurus on its front feet had these tremendous claws. This is several inches long, and in life, there would have been a horny sheath on here, like a cat's claw which have been several inches long, more inches. This thing, these would have been like a foot long in, or more in the, uh, when the animal was alive. These, these claw cores are very much sought after and if you see one for sale, it's usually quite expensive. Now this is a picture I took down at the National Geographic Museum and they had their Spinosaurus exhibit a few years ago about six or seven years ago. And they had assembled this model here. This is not a, a real skeleton, it's a model based on 
a skeleton that had been found near her food a few years earlier, uh, a skull that had been found, and various other isolated bones. The uh, one of the things that strikes you about this thing is these dorsal spines here. These are like five or six feet high, and it supported a big sail fin. This is the where the name Spinosaurus comes from, these spines. There's the foot-long claws on its front feet. There's the teeth we looked at a minute ago. And most, most authorities think this animal was semi-aquatic. It would swim in those big rivers and catch fish. And we'd use these great big claws to catch fish. And this was a huge animal, probably as much as 50 feet long and maybe anywhere from seven to nine tons. And it's bigger than any T-Rex that's ever been found. And this was in the theropod group. So this would have been the largest theropod that ever lived, at least that they know of. And you can go to a, a rock show and buy one of its teeth. This was outside. This is a mock-up of what the animal might have looked like in, in life. We don't, th we don't think it lived where there was snow. That was uh, the middle of winter one that year. But this is what it might have looked like fleshed out. But they know a little bit more about it now that they didn't know at that time. They think it also had a, do a dorsal fin down the back, back down the length of its tail, like right, right about here. And it would use its tail to swim, kind of like an alligator does. But that's a 50 foot long animal that would swim in the rivers over there and catch fish. Pretty, pretty amazing. Now I said I would mention a little bit about the Western Sahara Territory. This is an area south of Morocco, also along the Atlantic coast. Until the uh, 1970s, this was a, belonged to the Spanish. It was known as the Spanish Sahara. In the 70s, uh, Spain pulled out of it for, I'm not, for whatever reason, or right? decided it wasn't worth holding on to. And Morocco moved in. The uh, King of Morocco sent thousands of people into this area to occupy it. They've been there ever since. But not everybody recognizes Moroccan sovereignty over this area. There's a, a pro-independence group called the Polisario Front, which was fighting for independence for this area. Oh, by the way, this is about the, again, about the size of California, almost as big as the rest of Morocco put together. But there, like I said, there's the Polisario Front, which is a pro-independence movement. And for the, but for the last 30 years or so, there's been kind of this uneasy truce between them and the Moroccans. But that could break down at just about any time. And it could be trouble. So I've never been to the Western Sahara Territory, and I don't intend on ever going there. Anywhere else in Morocco, I would go. As safe a place as you could find anywhere. But I, I let other people handle the Western Sahara. But there are fossils there, and you do see these. Fortunately, the, the fossils that come out of, Morocco, of the Western Sahara usually come out through Morocco proper. And you can see these in, in Air Food and the Delt and places like that. There are a few notable localities. A few years ago, you would, they started finding megalodon teeth here at Boujdur. That would be a Miocene locality. Those were around for a while, but I haven't seen them in several years. So I'm not sure why they're not getting those anymore. Uh, further south here on the coast is Dakla. This is an Eocene site. But they, where they find shark's teeth and early whales. Now, I mentioned that 
Kariga is Eocene too, but that's earlier Eocene. There are no marine mammals at Kariga, but there are here in this later Eocene area. And uh, they were getting those for a while, but there again, um, they, 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 moved, they quit getting that. But they moved up here to this area called Gueron. It's out in the middle of nowhere. I understand it's 30 miles from the nearest water. There's really nobody lives there, but they are finding a lot of fossils. There again, it's Eocene. They found a lot of shark teeth and a lot of early whales. Told the, or, there, I read a few years ago that they named six species of early whale is coming out of here. That's one of the megalodon teeth from uh, Bouchdour. Uh, a little over five inches long. It's a nice size one. This side of it looks pretty good. The other side has some pretty crude uh, restoration on it, like a lot of things. But it was the best one I could find at the time. I got this in your food where the trilobites were prepped. That's uh, Otodus Sokolawi from Dakla. At the time they found, started finding these, they were calling them Carcaracles auriculatus, kind of like some of the ones that are found in the United States. But they decided this was a separate species, uh, Sokolawi. And they also moved it, it and Megalodon and some of the others into the genus Otodus along with Otodus obliquus, which is the older one that I showed you. That's a piece of a whale jaw, big tooth here. Pieces, you see my ruler here, that's about eight or 10 inches long with a big tooth. This is in the Bacillosaurus group. I'm I, well, from what I read, this is not actually in the genus Bacillosaurus but it's in that family. And this would have been a big animal, maybe probably 50 feet long, I don't know. It had very large teeth. That's another one in the Bacillosaurus family. This is a very well pre prepared tooth that I, I'm not sure which species there it is again, but I think it's in the Bacillosaurus family at least. This one is called Papacetus. You see three teeth here and a piece of bone. This has been stabilized with something to keep it from falling apart, but hasn't been further prepared. They think this was an amphibious animal. Still had functional hind legs. This is also from Garon. And there ain't more here. All right, well, that's that. I'm going to wind up the picture show here and just go over a few points that I want to make before closing. Like I said, fossil collectors paradise question mark. And there are several reasons why you would, might consider this a fossil collectors paradise. I can't argue with the abundance of fossils, the variety of fossils, quality of some of these things, availability, and price that you would pay at a, a show. You saw that Carcharodontosaurus tooth. The same, a very a similar tooth from a T. Rex would cost you about two more zeros on the price. But you can get these things for not always cheap, but for what they are, you can get some pretty good things to add to your collection. On the negative side, fake fossils. I mentioned the fake trilobites you see a lot of places and the fake mosasaur. You got to know what you're looking for and you got to trust your, the dealer you're getting it from. Working conditions. I showed you the guy cutting up limestone with a carbide saw with no very little protection. And the guys going in, that go into those tunnels to get dinosaur teeth risking cave-ins. Mention quality again, as long as there's very good quality stuff and there's very poor quality stuff that comes out of there. May not be fake, but it may be very poor prep job or very poor quality specimen. 
and finally lost to science. Now there, there are enough Spinosaurus teeth there to supply science and every collector that wants one. But some of these things are actually quite rare. Uh, like the, 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 I mentioned the, the skull of the Spinosaurus that uh, they based that model on. That had spent time in private hands for a number of years, but eventually found its way to a, a lab and was able to, they were able to help decipher what the animal looked like. So you can run into this question in uh, fossil collecting just about anywhere. There's long running debate as to whether amateurs, paleontologists and fossil collectors help or hurt the science of paleontology. And I'm not going to get into that now because you could spend all night arguing about it. So is it a fossil collector's paradise? That I'm going to leave up to each person to decide from themselves. And I think that's it. Uh, we'll stop sharing. If anybody has any uh, any questions, I'll be glad to at least attempt to answer them. Yeah, so I'll be, uh, there were several questions during the uh, presentation and if people have more questions, definitely put them in uh, and I'll start asking them uh, to Dr. Fair here. So the Far first away. question, oh, you, you, go ahead. Far away. Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> so uh, Bronwyn asks first, uh, how long do these uh, trilobites like the one I have right next to me here, uh, how long do they take to prep? To, to take out the rock? A fancy one like I uh, showed you, mate, will take uh, several days, even with that uh, proper equipment, those pneumatic tools. And so it's, it's slow going, even with the uh, modern equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, we had several people ask, how much do those, like ballpark, how much do those larger fossils like Mosasaurs cost? How much do they set you back? I mean, the whole skeleton? Yeah. You're probably talking five or six figures for a big one. Uh, and we also had uh, Fred asked, how much is replaced in these mosasaurs and, and skeletons? How much is, uh, you know, put in for, uh, that's not actual fossil? It varies. Uh, ideally, you don't want more, no more than uh, 10 or 15 percent. Some of those things are just so singular. You, you, you might have to fill in more than that, but you might that might be the only way you get the, the specimen at all. Like that big turtle I showed you. That may that may well be the only skeleton of that, full skeleton of that that's been found. That was pretty complete, but you know, any something else that's like that, you might have to it's either fill in half of it or get nothing. But 10 or 15 percent is usually acceptable as long as it's disclosed. So uh, I have a question for me here. Uh, I haven't hadn't heard too much about those elephants. I thought those were really cool. Uh, how common are those elephant fossils? Those are quite rare. Mm -hmm. I've, I've seen very few of them. Mm -hmm. You said it is a marine environment and these land animals would only be deposited there when the, the carcass would wash in from the shore. And with as many sharks and crocodiles that were there, most of them probably didn't make it to the bottom of the sea. And they only find just little isolated teeth and jaw fragments. Mm -hmm. And another question from me. Um, so uh, there's obviously all these resources are kind of like you know, concentrated in certain areas and things, and there's a lot right. of people trying to make money off them. Right. Um, how do people feel about the, how do dealers feel about other dealers and other fossil hunters? Do they all get along happily or is there intense competition or is it kind of like a, a guild type thing where they all uh, respect each other? Get, pretty much to get along. Mm -hmm. These major sites like Kariga, there's room for everybody. Mm -hmm. We're talking hundreds of square miles of phosphate to look at. If uh, an American, like one of us, wanted to go over there and start a big dig, you'd probably have to work with one of the local people to do it. They, you'd have to hire a local 
laborers to dig the hole and all that. And working for a foreigner, they might not like that. They might steal from you. So you, if you wanted to do that, you'd partner up with a guy like Kabir there. Have the, has anyone ever done that? Have uh, scientists come in and worked with the, the local people to, to work, cooperate on doing good science? Yeah, that, that happens, yeah. Uh, uh, Adam has taken, I don't know, if you're familiar with trilobites, you're probably familiar with the authority on them by the name of Ricardo Levi Setti. He's written a couple of famous books on trilobites. Adam has taken him over to I'll need to just a more mountain to do field work. So it, it does happen. Any more questions before we sign off anybody? Last minute things? And you can uh, raise your hand too, if that's a, if you say out loud. I have a question. Uh, go ahead. Say Bob, um, yeah. when you were mentioning the phosphate mines, you said that, uh, Oftentimes, some of the bigger uh, fossils would get bulldozed into the right. and turned into fertilizer, I guess. Right. right. That happens a lot. So is this not something that the owners would consider of some value to try to mine it or, or excavate it carefully to sell it and make some money doing that? Would that not be well, there? You're, you're talking about... I mean, it's not like gold. <laughs> you're talking about big corporations that own the big... Uh, phosphate mines or, or the government maybe i'm not sure who actually owns them but they process thousands of tons of rock a day and they're after quantity you run into the same issue in mining a lot of places you know where there are mineral specimens or fossils but in the time it would take a few men to uh, excavate a mosasaur skeleton they could have uh, they, those same men could have excavated a train load of phosphate ore. Yeah, I understand. That makes sense. So, just like when we go look for crystals in Pennsylvania, right? We're trying to save the crystals from the crusher. Right. The same thing. I understand. Like at, at the Lee Creek mine, they they won't even let their their workers pick up fossils because they don't want to take time away from operating machinery. So if a, if a worker at Lee Creek sees a thousand dollar shark tooth laying by the side of his machine, he's got to run over it with the machine and keep going. He would get fired if he picked it up. That's sacrilegious, Bob. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that happens a lot of places, not just with fossils. I just want to mention real quickly because I uh, I study human origins. Um, Morocco is very important in the in the in the human story because the fossil that's right next to me here uh, is the oldest specimen, the oldest uh, skull from our species, Homo sapiens, ever found, and it was found in Morocco, right. uh, close to the west coast, uh, in a place called Jebel Erhoud, and it's about three hundred thousand years old. Uh, so I thought that was a just a cool thing to add to the story of Morocco. I haven't, I haven't really mentioned uh, human artifacts, but they do find a lot of these Aculean hand axes over there in the desert. Some of those go back million, million and a half years. Yeah, see, it's very cool. You see those for sale in some of the fossil shops. Hey, Bob, what about all the little arrow points that they sell at those, at, well, not always but once in a while you'll see them at a show yeah they they find a lot of those out there too are those authentic some of them are i mentioned there are some that are not i'm not an authority on arrowheads on how you would tell the difference but i'm sure there's ways a lot of the uh thing things that are lying out in the desert get sandblasted with the wind blowing and they'll develop this kind of a patina on them. It's very characteristic of having been exposed to windblown sand. So if you see that, you know it's probably been lying out in the desert for a long time. Still, there may be ways to fake that too. I don't know. Well, I was asking because I think there may be a little bit of that fakeness in them, but I was impressed 
with the the variety of arrow points they had a lot of their small ones and their fancy notches right and i kept seeing more and more fancy notched arrowheads you know and one one uh, gentleman's uh one vendor that he had right. one vendor had all these different ones i like how can there be so many different notch styles yeah i don't know that that's not something i'm an expert on but you're probably right there probably are a lot of fakes in that area too you just got to be careful well thank you very much i truly enjoyed the presentation oh you're welcome yeah i think we can all yeah, say and we I'll let you go, Ron. Oh yeah, thank you, Bob. And I think that we maybe we should all go go to Morocco with you one day, and 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 that would be a wonderful follow up to this talk. Well, I encourage you to. Yeah, thank you so much for your time uh, and for the wonderful presentation that really uh, took us on a trip to Morocco. Uh, and uh, maybe someday we'll have you back to talk about uh, minerals and other stuff. Okay. Do this whole thing again on minerals. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And everybody, thanks for showing up and, and, and coming and getting smarter with us. Um, uh, I encourage you to buy some raffle tickets for the fossil uh, trip guided tour and um, hope to see you maybe this Sunday to look at some fossil seeds for uh, with George over here. He would love to see you there at the uh, at the nature connection. So Everybody stay well, um, stay curious, and take care. <laughs>